Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. If we mean this, it's the greatest thing you can possibly say. Come on, Jesus Christ is Lord. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer. Because Jesus is Lord, because we've acknowledged Him, given our lives to Him, it's, it's that's the main point of our whole life. We have, we're free, we're new people, we'll live forever, we'll be with Him in heaven. Oh, it's so good to be alive in Jesus Christ the Lord. We want to start off blessing everybody. Say, sprinkling water uh, on this television uh, show, is that going to do any good? If you have a heart open, there's no telling what could happen. When we did that, people with inoperable cancer could have been healed. When we did that, people who never knew Jesus could know Jesus today and give their whole lives to Him. People that will die soon will now have a happy death instead of a tragic one. People who are alienated from others, families, marriages that are broken can be reconciled. People who don't know their vocation can receive God's revelation on that. Those things that are holding people back, those things can be removed. You say, well, gee, you should have told me that before you sprinkled the water. I, I didn't know there was so much involved here. Well, let's pray right now. Father, because we are your children, we, you really are our Father. You've adopted us. Because of that, everything is different. Our whole life, our whole world is different. Thank you, Lord. Lord, may we live for you and for you alone. May we accept your Son, Jesus, as Lord, Savior, and God. May we live for him. May we love you with all our hearts and souls and mind and strength. May everyone watching this program give his self or herself to you as soon as possible, even at this program time. We pray all this now in Jesus' name, amen. If you're a mother, you might be especially interested in this program because we're going to talk about love, suffering, and motherhood. You say, what in the world? How does that all fit together? Well, that's what we're going to explain. Now, the word love is presented, presenting quite a problem it always has throughout history. Like, for example, the Greek has, um, I'm not sure, at least three different words for love. I guess it's possible it can even have four. Because you can see the word love, it, it means all kinds of things, some of which are incompatible with other meanings of love. So the Greek would have eros, which would mean kind of sexual love that would have nothing necessarily to do with commitment or, or, or real caring for the other person. Then there was philia, which would be kind of friendship love that wouldn't have the sexual connotations, but would be um, a concern for the other person. And then there is the agape, which is the kind of unconditional love, I love you no matter what that is way beyond concern it's, it's a divine love and you could probably even get another word or two in there for love but but see in english we just say love and some of what we mean by love is is absolutely contradictory to to other meanings of love so you can see our language is very inadequate compared to the Greek language. But it isn't just a language problem. Say, well, if we could just get a little improved uh, improvement in our language, we're all set. No, it's, we, it's our hearts that are the problem. And the Bible really tries to zero in on what love is instead of having this real mass of confusion. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. The way we came to understand love, or by this we've understood love, that Jesus laid down his life for us. We too must lay down our lives for one another. Jesus laid down his life for us. We too must lay down our lives for one another. So the Bible doesn't say this is one kind of love, this is one kind of love, this is one kind of love, like the Greek did. And the Bible doesn't just, just throw everything into love like English does. The Bible says a lot of this stuff you call love isn't love at all. And then the Bible says a lot of things that um, there's, no, there's no sense of differentiating kinds of love because those things aren't really love. And there's no sense in lumping everything together and call it love because a, a lot of those things that are described as love aren't love either. But the Bible says love is a commitment to a person to the point that you lay down your life for that person. Not because of your great dedication or power, but because you've accepted this divine power, this grace to do it. And, and you say, well, isn't that one form of love? The Bible says, no, that's love, period. And everything else is counterfeit love. That is love. So the Bible says love entails dying. Not dying because of some accident or as a victim of circumstances, but dying freely, laying down your life freely. And not a happy death, at least insofar as it was not painful, but a suffering death. Love means suffering and death, freely chosen because of a commitment to another person. And most of us, when we hear that definition, we say, well, that's a possibility in love. But it's not like you have to have that. Well, you don't have to have actually have physical death, but you have to have at least the, a kind of a mini deaths of suffering because of the relationship with that person or it's not love. Now, that would be a statement that many people would disagree with. They would say, well, love and suffering sometimes go together, but they don't have to go together. And the Bible says, yes, they do. They always have to go together. And even love and suffering is not, not, doesn't really mean it's love. It has to be love and freely chosen suffering for the sake of this other person because of the commitment. And anything other than that is not love. Hmm. We say, well, there's not much love around then, I guess. Probably. <laughs> that, that's a possible conclusion. But a lot of people would say, no, I love this person. I don't think I'll lay down my life for him. In fact, I won't even marry the person. But I love him. I say, no, you don't. You can, you can call it love, but that's not really love by biblical standards. You have, a, and it's not love in reality. You're, you're saying an affection or even a, a lust for a person is love, and it's not that at all. In fact, it's even contradictory to love. But um, a lot of people say, well, I don't think I would ever really lay down my life for this person, but I love them. I don't think I'd actually suffer for this person, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about them. I, I wish them well, and I try to do whatever I can to help them. But that's not love. That's doing whatever you can to help them. Say, well, isn't doing whatever you can to help them love? No. The Bible says, no, it isn't. Oh, okay. Love is not something you can just kind of get real easy as far as the Bible's concerned. I'm going to read a couple of passages here. One is from 1 Peter, first letter of Peter. And chapter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 22. By obedience to the truth, you have purified yourselves for a genuine love, a real love, not a fake love, not counterfeit, but the real thing, the genuine love of your brothers. Therefore, love one another constantly from the heart. 
you don't get love until you have been purified. And you don't get purified until there is truth, meaning true, committed, faithful relationships. And you don't get purified in the context of true and faithful relationships until you're obedient in those contexts. So you need obedience in the context of true relationships and then purification as a result of that. And then you can get authentic, genuine love. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, this, this is reason enough for you to make every effort to undergird your virtue with faith. So there's faith, then there's virtue. You can kind of picture steps. Your discernment with virtue, there's discernment. Your self-control with discernment, self-control. Your self-control should lead to perseverance. Perseverance to piety. Piety to care for your brothers. Care is not the same as love. And then care for your brother to love. You see all the steps? That, 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 that I think they even left one out here. Uh, but uh, you check it in your own translation. But the point I'm trying to make is love is the pinnacle of, a, of many, many transformations in a person's life. You don't love and then get transformed. You get transformed several times and then you love for the, in a way, the first time or at least the first time where it's pure and authentic. Well, with that in mind, love is a pretty, pretty rare thing. And we, we've got to understand that love and suffering go together. And now, I believe that motherhood, among its many other... Um, graces has a prophetic calling to connect love and suffering. That's, it's just, that's so important. The reason when we don't connect love and suffering, you know what we do? We abort a baby. When we don't connect love and suffering, you know what we do? We, we don't commit ourselves to other people. We don't get married. Uh, when we don't connect love and suffering, we don't accept our vocation. When we don't accept love, uh, connect love and suffering, we are unfaithful. When we don't connect love and suffering, we don't forgive. When we, when we don't connect love and suffering, we go to hell, basically. So this, this refusal to connect these two always, always, not like love sometimes results in suffering. Love always results in suffering. It, when we don't connect us to, this is the most tragic mistake we can make. Now, motherhood, uh, is a mother automatically knows that there's, even though any, everybody else can kind of entertain the lie, the confusion, the deception that this love won't necessarily incur suffering. I know love often does that, but it probably won't in this case. I'll be the exception. Of course, everybody thinks they're the exception, but there's no exception, so nobody's the exception. But, but no mother would say, well, uh, I am committed to, to, to my husband, and we have had sexual relations, and I've conceived a child. Now, this love is not going to result in suffering because uh, there will be no suffering in my pregnancy, and there will be no suffering in labor. I won't have labor. I'll just skip labor, and my baby will just kind of just come out, and I won't even feel the slightest little twinge of pain. No mother will maintain that. It's just, it's just out of touch with reality. Every mother knows that there's going to be pain. This is just the way it is. Now, this is the way it is with all love. But you can't even entertain any other possibility in the context of mothers. In the other cases, you can kind of kid yourself. So I think mothers say, there's no way, no other possibility. Love always results in the pain of pregnancy and the sufferings of labor. And that's only for starters. After that, there's all this other stuff. 
But see, mothers, just by biological function, will automatically, if they love, suffer. It's just, it's just, it's just automatic, biologically. Now, with other, other circumstances, even though they always go together, love and suffering, it's not connected biologically. But it is with mothers. So mothers show us this connection between love and suffering, which, as I said before, is an extremely important connection to always make, because in the one time you don't make that, you're going to do something terrible. You're going to, your marriage is going to break up. You're not going to be faithful to your church. You're, you're not going to live right. You're going to reject the, the opportunity to take up the daily cross. You're, you're just, when you miss that connection anytime, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. So that's what mothers do. They, among other things, they have this prophetic proclamation of the always connection between love and suffering. It's always true for them biologically. And it's always true for everybody else, whether it's true biologically or not. Now, mothers aren't the only people, though, who can proclaim this message. They can do it by virtue of just their biological situation. But everybody can do this. The Pope, John Paul II, wrote a document uh, oh, three or four years ago called On the Dignity and Vocation of Women. He said something that was at least kind of striking to some people. He said, every woman is a mother. Whether she is a mother physically or not, she's, all, she's a mother. He also said, every woman is a virgin, even if she's married, which you have to think about that for a while to figure that one out. But he says, every woman is a mother, every woman is a virgin, if she is a woman in Christ with her full femininity. Now, that's kind of a radical statement to make. When I read that, I thought, every woman is a mother, every woman is a virgin. That's hard to, hard to understand, that one. But, you know, the Bible goes even beyond that. The Bible says every Christian is a mother, whether that person is a male or female. So what, what, if, uh, what if somebody came up to me and said, well, hi, Mother Al, and I would say... I would say, what? <laughs> I've been called a lot of things, but that's, this is new. I, how could I be a mother? Uh, I could be called a lot of things, but there's no way I could be a mother. So, oh, yes, you could. And by Bible standards, you can be a mother irrespective of your sex. I'd say, wow, that's hard to understand. <laughs> well, let me, let me read a few verses here. John 16 in verse 21, Jesus is talking to his male disciples. And he's giving this analogy about a woman being in labor. John 16, 21, when a woman is in labor, she is sad that her time has come. When she has born her child, she no longer remembers her pain. For joy that a man has been born into the world. And say, well, you know, this is just an analogy. He's not saying these men are women, or these men are mothers. He's just saying this analogy of a mother, you might be able to apply this to your life. Well, it seems like he might be saying more than that. And you can tell it later because how did Paul understand the revelation like this or maybe things, other things that Jesus said or things the Spirit brought to the church? Galatians 4 and 19. Paul does not say that he's kind of benefited by seeing the analogy of a woman, in, of a mother in labor and, and the Christian life. He doesn't even say he sees himself as a mother in a, a kind of a just general way. He says in Galatians 4 and verse 19, he says, you are my children. He says, we could be a father then. And you put me back in labor pains. No, he couldn't be a father. You can't get put back in labor pains. And he says, in labor pains until Christ is formed in you. And he says, I was in labor pains over you once. Now I'm back in labor pains. So I'm in labor pains over you twice. Now, obviously, he doesn't mean this physically, but he certainly means it 
in a very real sense of the word. So Paul says, I am a mother not just insofar as I take care of people. I am a mother insofar as I am in labor pains. Not physically, but still spiritually. I'm a mother in that context of motherhood. I'm a mother insofar as I am in labor pains. In, in 1 Thessalonians, he kind of calls himself a, a mother again. This is in 1 Thessalonians in, in chapter 2. He doesn't, he says in verse 7, When we were among you, we were as gentle as any nursing mother fondling her little one. So he said, well, he didn't say he was a mother. He was saying he was as a mother. Yes, that's right. Now, look at this one, though. This is, uh, this is not Paul here. This is Jesus. Luke 8, 21 Luke 8, 21. Jesus looked at these crowd of people around, these disciples, and he said, My mother and my brothers, in a parallel passage, he says, My sisters, are those who hear the word of God and act upon it. You can not only be a mother, no matter what your sex is, you can actually be the mother of Jesus. Say, wow. So Jesus says everybody can be a mother, whether they're male or female, and everybody can actually be not just a mother, but the mother of Jesus. Say, I don't see how, how that can be. You, you make that decision by hearing the word and acting upon it. St. Francis of Assisi took that verse and just went crazy. He just went crazy. He just, he just thought that was so wonderful that he could be Jesus' mother, brother, and sister all at the same time. And he took it very seriously, and he just started talking about, I don't know about you, but I'm Jesus' mother. I'm a mother. Say, well, you're a mother. You're a male. How can you be a mother? And, how can you be Jesus' mother? Say, well, I am because I hear the word of God and act on it. Say, well, that doesn't really mean you're, you're his mother. Say, oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. And um, so he really got into that. He didn't take that as just some sort of little poetry. He took that as something of great practical, personal, real significance. So... Would you, uh, would you decide to be a mother? And not only a mother, but the mother of Jesus. Would you decide to, to do it by hearing the word of God and acting upon it? Well, would you decide to be a prophet or a prophetess proclaiming the connection between love and suffering? Now, that you have the same decision that a girl who is contemplating an abortion has. A girl that is contemplating abortion, she doesn't want to accept the suffering of the pregnancy and the suffering of the labor. So she wants to abort the baby. Say, well, yeah, but this is different. I'm, I just don't want to accept the, the suffering of being rejected or the suffering of making sacrifices or the suffering of being hurt. And so that's different. It's still, it's the same principle that the, the, the girl who chooses abortion is operating on. You know, the people having abortions, they're not the only ones uh, who are against life. They're just expressing it in that way. Our whole culture is abortifacient. Our whole culture... Uh, tries to separate suffering from, from love and from life. And unless you're willing to choose suffering and choose to love knowing that you're always going to suffer when you love, unless you're going to choose that, and that would be hearing the word and putting it into action, you are making, at least in principle, the same decision 
as a girl who chooses to abort her baby. So you see that people are choosing abortion constantly, even when they're not talking about abortion. They're operating on the same principles. So it's a very difficult decision to make to be a mother. And when we see all millions of mothers refusing to be mothers, why would we choose anything differently? Because of God's grace. Choose to be a prophet or prophetess of love and suffering together. Choose to obey, hear, and act on the word of God. Choose to be a mother. Choose to go back into labor pains. Choose to suffer in love. Choose to be a mother by Jesus' standards. Let's pray. So, Lord, we've talked about suffering and love and motherhood, and now it comes time to choose. Lord, we choose to be mothers. We choose to be prophets and prophetesses of love and suffering together. We choose the daily cross. We choose to obey and live your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands.